Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, session, uh, Pay for Success, uh, Fertilizing Investment Innovation, uh, in track number one, Harvest Good Business. Uh, my name is Stephen Wong. Uh, I am your facilitator for this session. I am the um, exec, uh, de Deputy exec Executive Director uh, and Head of Public Policy Institute of our Hong Kong Foundation, uh, one of the think tanks in Hong Kong. And so we are honored today to have four uh, distinguished uh, speakers and panelists uh, to come and uh, share with us their thoughts. Uh, the way we have the rundown is that we will invite them to come and speak to us for uh, 12 minutes each. So I will come ask them to come up uh, one by one and I will introduce them before they speak. So our first speaker is uh, Elvin. Um, he is, uh, you can see from the bio, he is the uh, senior researcher of our Hong, Hong Kong Foundation. And uh, as we have done a research report previously on this exact topic. So uh, let me just uh, give the time to Elvin. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon, Elvin. My name is uh, Elvin. Um, I'm the senior researcher from our Hong Kong Foundation. Okay, yep. So uh, I'm Elvin, a senior researcher from our Hong Kong Foundation. And uh, today I will talk about um, the pay for success mechanism, or what we commonly known as uh, SIP, social impact bond. So the idea for pay for success, uh, PFS, is a little bit complicated. Therefore, uh, at the very beginning, may I just use a very simple picture to illustrate what is um, briefly the overall result of uh, PFS if uh, government want to use, it, use this instrument. Um, for the PFS, um, for the government, so uh, we all know that government have uh, quite a number of uh, social service projects, a lot of social projects. So this project may fail, um, say maybe some problem with delivery. And by using PFS, uh, the government can really pay for success. That is, they will only pay for the social projects only if the project works. That is the middle pay for success. But if you are the investors, the situation is just reverse, okay? You get paid only if the social project works, okay? So get paid only if. So that is, um, the government try to shift the surface risk, the risk of failure to the investors. That is, the investor providing certainty to the government in this case. And in return, the government will provide financial interest to the investors. That's the overall mechanism of pay for success. So this is the general overall result. And that is a very good positive and significant side effect. So in the previous slide, we always, I always mention, so only pay only if social service works, but how can we determine whether social service works or not? We need to use a outcome-based evaluation uh, system. Uh, in Hong Kong, there's a lot of social service, social projects. So we got a, a subvention system. And in, but most of the uh, key performance indicators is really based on output, not outcome. So what is the meaning of output? That is, the number of people you have served, the number of service hours you provided. But can you really tell whether the beneficiaries can have positive change or really benefit from your service or not? So the KPI right now, the output-based KPI, cannot really tell you this type of uh, result. And in the PFS, outcome-based evaluation is important and is essential because uh, we care about the change of the beneficiaries. We don't, we don't just care about the number of beneficiaries uh, uh, enjoy the service. So therefore, everyone engaged in this PFS, so there's a pilot program of PFS right now in Hong Kong, Engage in this uh, pilot uh, PFS uh, program, you are in fact one of the member try to, uh, try to shift the whole society from an output-based evaluation to an outcome-based evaluation. So here is the most detailed, complicated uh, mechanism for uh, pay for success. So the whole mechanism begins with an investor. So the investor will first uh, provide a a lump sum that is a principal through the intermediaries to the service providers. 
And the service providers um, provide, uh, uh, so it's uh, normal NGOs, provide the service to the people in need, that is the beneficiaries. And there is an, an other stakeholder called evaluators, try to evaluate the impact, the change of life of the beneficiaries. So if the impacts are satisfactory, and the government will then pay according to the outcomes achieved. The more the outcome achieved, the more the government will pay to the investors as an interest, and also we pay the principal. Here, I give you an example. So this example is called New Pin Social Benefit Bond. So New Pin Social Benefit Bond is in Australia. So in Australia, there is uh, quite a number of uh, children that they, their, their families are, are quite problematic. Maybe their parents are drug addicted, uh, maybe are facing some violence problem, and they need to be placed in a um, care center. And the new PIN program try to restore this, uh, this type of children safely back to their home, back to their parents. And this social, uh, social benefit bond is used to finance that program. So uh, if you look at this schedule, this is the interest rate schedule. When the restoration rate, that is the percentage of children restored to, the, to their family, is 60%, then the interest rate is about 50%. But if the, if, if the, if the restoration rate is dropped to 40%, the interest rate will drop to 2.1% only. Okay? So the interest payment is totally depending on whether the program succeeds to restore their children back to their family or not. And the result in the past few years, the bond, I mean the result of that bond in the past few years is quite satisfactory. Okay, have a look. In 2015, the interest return is 8.92. Uh, 2016, 12.15. And 2017, 13.16. Uh, so it is really a um, uh, good return if compared to other types of uh, financial instrument. Okay? And more importantly, Okay. Oh. Yep. And more importantly, the repayment of principal is also depending on the performance. So uh, the restoration rate, if the, if the rate is 55%, the investor can get back 100% of the principal invested. But if the rate drops to 40%, the investor can get back only 62.5%. So that is the risk bared by the investor. And that's the risk that the project may fail. In this case, so the government will, in fact, shift the risk to the investor because they need not to repay the full 100% uh, of the principal. And I want to share with you a very interesting example. This example is in New, New York. Okay? So the whole program is uh, targeting to reduce the re incarceration rates. And the, the higher is the reduction, uh, the more the investor can get. Okay? So the investor in this project is Goldman Sachs. Um, they invest 9.6 million in this project. Uh, unfortunately, this project, the project itself failed. The overall reduction cannot achieve uh, a 10 percent, more than 10 percent. I, I remember just 8.7 percent. And therefore, the New York City need not to pay anything to the investor. That is Goldman Sachs. Okay? So in this sense, I think the, 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 the SIP or P for success system still work because they save the uh, money from the uh, New York government, New York City government. And, and in this uh, uh, projects, so uh, Goldman is quite like, lucky because uh, they get a guarantor, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy, um, they try to guarantee uh, 7.2 million uh, to Goldman Sachs, therefore they, they, Goldman Sachs uh, uh, need not to suffer the 100% loss, okay? So this is an example for the, what we call uh, risk sharing. So this type of uh, uh, so, uh, uh, mechanism is quite good for some preventive services. Because so when we are doing preventive services, in long run, they may have some cost saving because they prevent some disease or uh, a significant uh, dis some disaster to happen. But this type of uh, service may have uncertainty. And by using PFS, this uncertainty can be shipped to the investors. Okay? And the government can, uh, you know, um, can enjoy certain certainty, uh, certainty from the uh, investors. Same. Same situation applies to innovation. Innovation, so a lot of uh, innovative ideas, they may have long-term benefit to the society, but they will have a high risk of failure. 
So if the government can use this PFS mechanism to shift the risk to the investors, then they can have more, they may have um, more willingness to uh, do more uh, innovation in this case. Um, so that's how the PFS can benefit these two uh, type of service. So this is the recap so, uh, of uh, the, the benefit of PFS. Uh, there's outcome-based uh, outcome based contracting. That is, uh, when we are doing evaluation, we look into outcome, not only output. Okay? And uh, the government can share the risk to the investors, and in the long run, they may have some cost saving because a PFANTIP service can be enhanced. Okay, the, my last slide is about the challenge of PFS. So PFS um, is good in, uh, in different ways. But um, there's a little bit, uh, there's several challenges that need to be uh, solved so that we can implement PFS in Hong Kong. The most challenging task is that, um, although we want to measure outcome, but not many, the number of outcomes that can be measured may not be that, that, that many, right? So for example, your, your feeling, your psychological well-being, so it is difficult to, to measure. And therefore, uh, this is a limitation for the PFS at the very beginning. And um, the second one is the uh, preferred uh, incentive because uh, the stakeholder, maybe the evaluator, maybe the investor, service provider, may try to find someone who can be served easily. Okay? So for example, if you are talking about a poverty line, so people, if you want to uh, reduce the number of people under poverty line, the best group of people to be served is those just, just below the poverty line, right? Those really far below the poverty line, you, you, are, you, 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 you don't want to serve them because it's almost impossible for them to get, get, get out of the, 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 get above the poverty line. Therefore, this may be, uh, this is the second uh, challenge. And the last one is, um, the whole process is very complicated, and therefore, um, the cost is, uh, is uh, quite a lot. And if the scale of the project is not big enough, then uh, the cost effectiveness of uh, using PFS may not be uh, um, satisfactory. So um, that's all of uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elvin. Uh, our next speaker to share is um, uh, Xiao Rong. Uh, she is the head of philanthropy services of Greater China of UBS, uh, where she joined uh, uh, recently, I think. And prior to her current role, she worked with Give to Asia as the vice president and China chief representative, building up the China program and office, leading grant making and philanthropy advisory services in China. Xiao Rong. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for Alan's uh, very clear introduction. I guess everybody already understands the model, how actually it's going to work. Particularly, he explained from the perspective of a government as a pay success for a commissioner, what their concerns and what their motivation to do that. And I'm going to um, briefly introduction of, uh, from the perspective of the investor, you know, uh, as the Open Foundation, what we have been doing and what we have learned and, uh, and what we are looking forward, um, particularly in Hong Kong. Okay, before I started, I just take a very few minutes to talk about the Optin Foundation. So UBS Optin Foundation was found, is a charitable foundation founded by UBS and its clients to support the programs with highly impact, highly quality, and the pruner and the sustainable um, in outcomes to benefit the most vulnerable children all over the world. So we are mainly focused on, focus on uh, to ensure children's health, safety, and be well educated in order to be uh, ready for their future. So this is our major um, focus, sorry, focus area. And uh, 
Since we established in 1999 in Switzerland, we have expanded our network globally wide. Uh, now we have six uh, uh, location uh, network in um, UK, uh, Germany, United States, Hong Kong, and uh, mainland China. Of course, headquarters based in Switzerland. And we supported the programs of all of the um, 14 countries since we established. And um, when we work with our donor clients, what is our main um, value added to them? Why our clients working with us? So as a, as a charitable foundation, one of our major uh, focusing is charitable financial programs. So for most of our financial pests, uh, when they are giving, when they are particularly a large amount giving, they are also facing some challenges themselves. First is to really understand the needs and what's the deep roots of the social needs. Um, secondly, uh, once you identify the needs, how you are going to help to resolve it. Who might be your good partners and what might be the right mechanism to uh, actually implement to try to achieve your goal. Thirdly, during the project implementation, how some of the financial I think, still concern how their projects will be implemented as scheduled or as planned, or how the money will be expended. And finally, the most important, they really care about what's the money, what's the project's difference has been made, what outcome has been made. So during that perspective, uh, for those perspectives, Optum Foundation uh, try our best to make the value we, we could make. So first we have our team with uh, very high experienced professionals and also we work uh, worldwide or class uh, external you know, expertise and also we uh, have local field workers over there. So we have a very um, semantic, well-defined program management um, procedure. And also we invite external evaluator who really measure the outcome and uh, the work and uh, the impact. So finally, we, uh, as Option Foundation, we have our donors' clients funding, 100% goes to financial pay programs. And all the other costs, administrative costs, the voluntary costs, eva evaluation costs will be covered by Alton Foundation. So that's basically what we are doing in terms of financial pay work. But today, um, may, I'm sorry, yeah, not get used to it. The main purpose today here is talk about our, uh, since 2017, Optimus Foundation have reshaped its focusing point uh, from financial pay program to, uh, from only one focusing, focusing point, that is financial pay program, into two, plus f social finance. So why we're doing that? So look at these uh, numbers here. So uh, everybody knows that like, UNDP has their uh, sustainable delay, um, development goals, which actually outlined all those uh, biggest issues uh, facing by the globally wide. And, uh, and also based on UN's stat statistics and their survey, there's a huge finance gap uh, that should be invested to addressing those issues. So currently, uh, there were about uh, only 10 million from traditional charitable giving annually based. But uh, it's going to be actual 2.5 actual uh, uh, trillion US dollar needed in order to meet the SDGs. And while we'll look at the uh, traditional, uh, I'm sorry, it's financial market here, it's over 200 trillion. So look at it, it's only 1% of the financial um, uh, markets money, if they could be invested into social sector, that's probably will be helping us to address the globally uh, biggest issue outlined by the UNDP SDGs. So I think that's the one way, one way to think about it is to really think about innovative financing mechanism that's going to bring those finance 
those finance investments which probably are not interested in traditional charitable giving, those funding from more private se sector or from government. So that's why um, UBS uh, Optum Foundation start to explore uh, this uh, uh, new mechanism since uh, uh, early in 20, uh, 20, 2014 or 2012. Okay, I need to catch up. So social finance, um, basically it's the main focus on measurable outcome. So by 100% measurable outcome, we want to maximize the capital invested in the programs. So by doing that, we were really in target thinking about those uh, um, private sector who would like to um, go ahead with the evidence-based or with the improvement that programs is going to work. So basically, uh, as, because Alan has a very uh, careful introduction of this model, so we'll go very quickly. So UBS uh, Option Foundation will basically play the role as the investor, risk investment investor. And we were uh, basically looking at the projects, working with the implementer. The Im implementer can be the non-profit organization or social enterprise or, or commercial registration entity, whatever they were uh, joined together to target the issue they were, we were addressing to. And uh, also we were um, looking for when this model are defined, we are also looking at the second, the third in the evaluator. So who can also work together with the implementer and the investor and also the outcome payer to define the metrics that will really evaluate the outcome. So as the whole, when we look at the four stakeholders, investor, implementer, and the evaluator and outcome players. So who is going to take the lead? So basically, it's a joint effort. But anyhow, I think the Open Foundation is taking the risk. So for the investor, we are thinking we are the risk investor to try to mobil, um, maximize the, all the efforts jointly. Okay, let me uh, briefly also introduce the, uh, the, the pilot, the case, uh, which is uh, uh, the first education development impact bond initiated by uh, Optum Foundation in 2015. So this, this project actually is located, it's trying to address the issue in the India, Rajasthan. So India has like, a, um, even though the government make tremendous efforts to enroll uh, the students, uh, kids for education, but still there are three million uh, eligible kids are out of school. And particularly in Rajasthan area, this place, they will have a very particular poor uh, school access. And for those girls who have even like twice uh, likely um, compared with a boy to access to the school. So that actually is the root uh, for the inequality in, in of the gender in the, in the whole society or in that area. So trying to address that issue, uh, Optum Foundation as an investor to work with the uh, uh, education girl uh, as an implementer, we are provide the upfront working capital to them. And also we invite ID Insight as a third party evaluator. And for this, case, for this um, projects, the children, the Children Impact uh, Invest Children Investment Fund Foundation is outcome player, uh, outcome payer. So we were uh, these projects basically uh, trying to benefit uh, seven thousand three hundred children, and uh, basically and also trying to recruit those young, uh, the age from seven to fourteen girls, and able to uh, enroll them to the school. So after three years, the project demonstrated is very successful. And the enrollment uh, is, uh, so 
So basically, this project is looking at the two KPIs, outcomes evaluated. One is the learning outcome, and another one is the enrollment outcome. So after three years, it's proved to be very successful. And as an investor, uh, we got a refund. We got uh, the uh, payment from the uh, payer, and uh, not only our initial capital, but also the uh, uh, return rate. It's about like 15%. So uh, for this kind of uh, uh, pilot project, after this pilot project su successfully in India, we drove a lot of uh, attention and attraction to the uh, India government and some other in development institutions and uh, even um, some private sectors investor who would like to do a uh, pilot or uh, experience more uh, projects. Actually, afterwards, we started two other uh, independent uh, development impact from bonds projects in India. Uh, one is the targeting and the uh, mentality, uh, mental and the newborn health program in Rajasa, uh, India. And we got the um, uh, outcome payer commit 11 million uh, US dollar for four years. Uh, after we uh, initiate all the projects. And also another one is for the education projects in India. And the government, India government uh, showed very, uh, and make a great um, particip participating uh, in that projects. So um, currently we were also looking for, as the Optin Foundation, looking for the opportunity, particularly in Hong Kong. Uh, after being uh, doing three successful, uh, or some two of them are still in the process, but we are, uh, really would like to test and build up the model uh, localized in Hong Kong and working with the stakeholders in Hong Kong to develop uh, impact development bonds model here. Okay, I will end it here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Xiaorong. Uh, next, uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Kwok Che Hung, uh, CEO of Pan Impact Korea, to share with us uh, his experience doing SIB uh, projects in Korea as uh, he did the first SIB project in Korea. Mr. Kwok. Hello, I'm Jae Hoon from Pan Impact Korea. Now I'm going to tell you about social impact bond in Korea. Um, Pan Impact Korea is the first intermediary of social impact bond in Korea and in Asia. So I'm going to tell you about, about it. The contents of the presentation are as, as follows. But I think you already heard about SIB and PFS, so I will proceed SIB part very quickly. SIB is a contract that private investors invest capital needed for the public project and the government pays back financial return to the investors only when social outcomes are achieved. As you see, traditionally, if government wants to cooperate with private sector, then there, there are only two stakeholders of government and service provider. But with SIBs, these three more Three more stakeholders participate in the structure. They are investor, intermediary, and evaluator. SIB structure has all the important concept of today's innovation. You can see impact investing, measuring result, and public-private cooperation. SIB has a lot of advantages. As you see, ordinary government pays for expenses in advance, while we can pay for success through SIBs. It means you can spend the taxpayers' money on social outcomes rather than expenses. I briefly explained about SIB, and now I will share with you, or with you the case of the first SIB in Korea. This is the structure of Seoul SIB. As you see, outcomes payer is Seoul Metropolitan Government, and the intermediary is Pan Impact Korea. There are three investors and a service provider. And the evaluator is a university located in Seoul. 
You can see brief chronology of Seoul SIB, but because of time limits, I will skip it fast. Anyway, I suggest the SIB policy to Seoul city government seven years ago, and we became the intermediary in 2015. And service provider start, started intervention in 2016. This is very important part of the presentation. Now, I tell you about the theme of the project. The target population is borderline intellectual functioning children. In short, BIF children. Have you ever heard of BIF before? I, I guess the majority had, has not heard of it. That means BIF are left in the blindest part of interest, and we have not cared of them. The BIF has the intellectual level from 71 to 84. The intellectual level greater than 84 is normal, so we do not need to help them. The intellectual level less than 71 is mentally retarded. They are classified as disabled, and the government provides them social educa special education and pensions. But BIF people are totally out of our concern, and if we leave behind BIF children, as you see in, in red characters, the probability of becoming welfare beneficiaries is 15 times higher than the children with ordinary IQ levels. It means they, there is a strong correlation between learning ability and social independence. The, the worst thing is that if we leave them behind, they have tendency to become mentally retarded as their IQ levels decline as time goes on. IQ level is a relative index, and for example, if a child, child at elementary school was BIF, and as time goes on, he still stays intellectual level of elementary school because he could not learn and follow schooling. That results in becoming mentally retarded when the child grows older. It means our government and society wait and just see until our children became disabled, and then government spent a huge amount of money after they became handicapped. Therefore, Seoul SIB will prevent lots of social costs if we succeed to improve their learning ability and sociality. The target population is the children who could not receive any policy support if we did not start a SIB project for them. This is the summary of Seoul SIB. For three years, it helps about 100 BIF children living in child welfare facilities in Seoul. The objective is to improve children's IQ level and sociality. The size of in investment is not big as it is about 1 million US dollars only, but it, actually, it was very hard to persuade the government, government officials to increase project size for the first SIB in Korea. But the, but the investment size was not a problem because we made a meaningful start to help BIF children. The service provide, provider provides a comprehensive intervention program for the children. Before develop cognitive or learning ability, they tried hard to recover children's psychological and emotional stability. After this, the service provider started, started improvement of learning ability. The service provider is able to support the children with this kind of long-term and comprehensive intervention program because we can perform multi-year project with SIB. Seoul SIB project gives a lot of implications. First of all, we can improve the quality of lives of BIF children, and we can raise social interest for them. If we succeed, then we will have a chance to spread the policy through, through the evidences. With SIB, government can spend taxpayers' money efficiently and effectively. Also, it gives a new opportunity for impact investors. Finally, it can show people how innovative method can change the society and government. 
Now I'll share with you the subsequent changes in Korea after the first SIB. First, there were increased interest about SIB among local governments when Pan Impact Korea launched the first SIB. And several local governments formed SIB Local Government Council of Korea. It was established to share the knowledge and promote the expansion of SIBs among the local governments. Pan Impact Korea provides advice and education to the member governments as the secretariat of the council. Also, four more local governments have passed SIB ordinance after Seoul, and currently, five local governments have SIB ordinances. Ordinance is the law of municipal government. So, and in addition to this, several local governments are preparing new SIB projects. In this year, the central government, which supports and evaluates local governments, added new evaluation criteria for local governments, that is SIB. So if a local government prepares or starts a SIB project, then it can get higher evaluation score from the central government. Lastly, I will tell you our interesting attempt to overcome the limitations ordinary SIBs have. To do this, Pan Impact Korea applied blockchain technology to SIB and named it Smart SIB. It became the world's first blockchain combined SIB. With Smart SIB, now investors can trade SIBs and income per share is calculated automatically. Also, investors can check their accounts and final incomes with Smart SIB. I think it improved the inter intermediation method of impact investing and it will extend the opportunity for the market. Okay, it is all of my presentation. Thank you for listening. To me. Okay, um, thank you, Jae Hoon. And last but not least, uh, our last speaker is uh, Alex uh, Nichols, and uh, Professor of Social Entrepreneurship in Said Business School, University of Oxford in UK. And he is also an editor, the editor of the Journal of Social Entrep Entrepreneurship. Alex, thank you. Can you hear me? Well, I'm gonna have to, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. I'm gonna walk around a bit, so I'm gonna upset this man with the camera, I'm sorry. I can't stand behind podiums all day. Okay, so uh, I'll see if I can make this technology work. There we go, that's me. So, uh, Aunt Sib Sexy, look at this. The name's Bond, Social Impact Bond. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're all here, so it's wonderful to, you know, you people must think this is interesting, because unless you've come to the wrong room, because uh, this is an amazing phenomenon, pay for success in SIBs. So it's such an amazing phenomenon, it has its own movie. This is SIB the movie, or it's called The Invisible Heart. Has anyone seen The Invisible Heart? It's produced in Canada, but it's an entire film around uh, the development of pay for success and social impact bonds. So this is incredibly, people are incredibly excited about it. Here's Sir Ronald Cohen. Uh, he's one of the pioneers of pushing this, a former financier in Britain, now one of the leading lights in pushing impact investing globally. Uh, and he features heavily in this film. And for him, social impact bonds are the, most, the single most important innovation in kind of impact finance in the world. A bit later on, we'll come to, uh, to maybe test that assumption. Um, so my job is to give you a quick overview of flying tour around the world of the kind of global picture of SIBs and give you some information from the academic perspective about where you can read more about SIBs if you're interested to, and what resources there are out there. So here's the snapshot uh, slide. As of at least uh, a couple of weeks ago, there's 121 SIB contracts live. So these are not the ones in development. There'll be many more in development around the world. Um, mostly they're social impact bonds. There are eight development impact bonds and one environmental impact bond, EIB. You can see they're dominated by the UK. The first SIB in the world was in the UK, the Peterborough bond in 2010. Then the US, uh, then a range of up to 24 countries now working on these. 
Beneficiaries range from very small, 22 people, to the rather absurd 65,000 people. Um, sorry, 650,000 people. Uh, that's an outlier. That's actually the Washington DC environmental impact bond, which is uh, designed to help prevent uh, flooding in DC. And so they took as their sample population everybody in DC who might be flooded, uh, which is a large number. So it's a slight outlier. The average is much smaller, around 565 five people. And the investment's small, as you can see, anything between 80K dollars US and 25 million. Uh, the average is only about 4 million US dollars. Uh, US SIBs are slightly bigger than UK SIBs, and development impact bonds look like they'll be slightly bigger than social impact bonds. Total investment is tiny, 400 odd million US dollars so far, so it's an interesting question to ask ourselves why we're so excited by this when it's actually a very small amount of investment, and I think the reason is because it's an exciting model. Um, and the reality check is to say in the US, something like 800 billion US dollars is spent by government, in the UK, something like 220 billion pounds. So think of that in terms of welfare spending compared with SIB investment. So it's actually a tiny amount of money, but obviously a very exciting model. It has its own film. So if you really want to know about uh, real-time global SIB information, this is where you go. It's the Social Finance UK, uh, interactive and um, pretty much real-time SIB database website. And they give you information of all the SIBs that are live around the world. Those are those little blobs. And you can click on them and that'll give you information about each SIB in that area. So you can find your area and uh, hopefully uh, get more information. There's the I think the Korean one is there. Uh, so 121 impact bonds, we've covered this already. You can see the numbers there. They also give you some breakdowns which are very interesting on the website. So these are the uh, activity areas that SIBs are addressing so far. You can see that workforce development is the biggest and then housing, health and so on. You can read them. And not so easy to, to read. This is the website, sibdatabase.socialfinance.org.uk. So that's where you need to go for, I think, the most uh, up-to-date and authoritative information about global SIBs and DIBs. Have you all got that? Anyone wanted to write that down? Have you written it down? If not, email me. Okay, so other, other things you can uh, use as resources. Uh, a little UK focus here, forgive me, but we did start this, uh, this uh, project. The UK government has a social impact bond centre with a website where you can go and look at everything from pro forma contracts to information about how the UK market has developed. Uh, our colleagues at Oxford in the School of Government, the Bovatnik School, have established something called the Go Lab, the Government Outcomes Lab, which is, I would say, the, the number one research centre in the world looking at uh, SIBs and pay for success and payment by results contracts. They've got an amazing team of people. They do an annual conference. If any of you are anywhere near Oxford, um, I'd advise you to go to it. Um, it's in uh, September normally. Uh, but there's a lot of resources on their website that you can download for free about uh, SIBs and DIBs. Name check uh, our colleagues in Hong Kong. Anki, wherever you are, there you are, and her team. So this is, uh, I think, the first um, uh, kind of consultancy and advisory uh, organization here in Hong Kong supporting the development of SIBs. So they need a big round of applause later. Publication. So there's an emerging literature on this stuff. Uh, if you want to go and read about it, there's a, there's a snazzy new book, Payment by Results. That's the second from the left you can see there, which is a you know, good overview of this, uh, this field. And then there are particular deep dives by people like the Brookings Institute, which is the kind of... Uh, orangey, yellowy report, and then other particular sort of specific reports about dibs and so on. And you can get regional reports too. So there's quite a lot of information emerging now that you can use to study this stuff if you're interested. Just want to point out two, uh, briefly two case studies that we've been involved uh, in writing, which uh, we can offer you for free if you'd like to read them. So we began work on SIBs right at the beginning with the Peterborough uh, pilot in Britain in 2010, and we've written uh, the first case study of that um, in the world, and that's available to you if you'd like it from our website. So this is the structure. I won't go through all of this. You've seen structuring already, but this is, I think, a very really clear way of showing the relationship between um, government investors and service providers. 
and in the report you'll also see the results, which you probably know were broadly uh, deemed to be successful across two cohorts of prisoners. This was the, in case you don't know, this is a social impact bond that looked at prisoners, uh, short-term prisoners who were not getting any kind of government support when they left prison. So very often, well, 70% of them would re-offend within a year and be back in prison. And the idea was if we give them a support, a better support in prison, and when they come out, they'll stop offending. And that's actually good for everybody, including the prisoners. And so the measure was how much do we reduce their offending once they've left prison. And the results, and it was done in, in two cohorts of 1,000 a, a prisoners each. And the results were reductions in reoffending against a control group that you can see up there. And this triggered a payment back to the investors, which, who were a mix of foundations uh, and a couple of in, institutional investors as well. So broadly speaking, that was considered a success. There's other stories I could tell you later about that. Now, you've done this already, but I just point out that my colleague, Gail Peterson at Oxford, um, has written a the authoritative account of the Educate Girls uh, Development Impact Bond that Optimus were involved in. And, uh, and again, we can provide that case study if you're interested. But we've kind of had the results, so, uh, and you've seen this already, that uh, Optimus was the investor, Educate Girls were the provider in India of the services, uh, and the Children's Investment Foundation Fund were the, uh, the outcomes payer in this model. And then there were other players like Dahlberg and Instiglio who were advisors and impact measure, measurement specialists. And as you've, you've seen already then, it's, it was a three-year pilot uh, across uh, a large number of schools scattered across villages in Rajasthan in northwest India, uh, reaching just over 7,000 children. And a, a, you know, a very modest investment, I guess, but it was a pilot of 270,000 US dollars focused on girls' attendance at school and their literacy and numer numeracy performance against the cohort uh, of a control group. And as you've seen, it was a success. So the two measures of impact that they wanted to use, which were the, um, the attendance at school, because of course for girls in India, particularly rural India, um, you know, many, many don't go to school at all because they have to stay at home or they have to work in the fields or it's culturally difficult for them to go to school. So attendance was an important uh, target, and they, uh, they outperformed the target for the, for the payment of the SIB, sorry, the DIB, um, and they also uh, used a measure of, of literacy and learning against a um, control group, and they also outperformed that very well. So that was considered a success. I mean, interestingly, as, um, as was mentioned earlier, the result was very successful for UPS Optimus, who got a very substantial return on their initial investment of $267,000 of $422,000 from the foundation, uh, Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Um, but uh, to be fair, that very uh, handsome 52% return on investment uh, was reduced by a, uh, a payback to educate girls of their return to kind of, I guess, uh, recognize their contribution to the excellent results of this dip. And those are some of the other effects of it that you can read. So it's interesting that, you know, the first, so we, we, we deliberately wanted to write a case at Oxford of the first social impact bond, the Peterborough one, the first development impact bond in Rajasthan, because it's interesting to have both of those written up. Okay, just a couple more things before I close. Um, and this is based on work, so we've been working on, as, as you can see from what I've shown you, on this space for nine years now. So we have, I think, uh, pulled together quite a lot of research. So first of all, the three myths of social impact bonds that we have to test. One is that, that they deliver improved social outcomes. Two is that they save public money. And three, that they pay back their investors. And what our research has shown us is that for the first one, there is certainly good evidence of this. Um, SIBs and DIBs do seem, as we've seen with the two examples just before, do seem to deliver improved social outcomes. But that, there's a caveat there. The caveat is often these, um, the point of SIBs and DIBs is addressing areas where there's either no provision at all or very poor provision. So it's quite likely they would do better than that unless it was a disastrous intervention. So yes, they do seem in most cases to improve social outcomes, but that's against a very low baseline often. 
Saving public money, there's almost no evidence of that at all. That's a complete myth. Um, it's not that the structure of SIPs and DIBs do not, in principle, reduce government spending, because they do. But the fact is governments can almost never realise that. So if you think of Peterborough, if you reduce people's reoffending rates, if you actually want to save money as a government, what do you do? You close a prison, you sack some policemen, you sack some judges in the courts. And that's the only real way you save actual money on the balance sheet of, in this case, the Ministry of Justice in Britain. So, you know, at scale, perhaps this is true. You know, if, if, if SIBs and DIBs become the way that public services are delivered, and some people excitedly think that could be the future, then you might see real savings. At the moment, I think there's almost no evidence. This is a, and yet it's the thing that government likes best about these. They think they're going to save money, but they don't. Making money for social investors, yep, yeah, social investors, as we saw with UBS Optimus, are making some handsome returns on these. So that, if we want to take SIBs to the market, is encouraging, I guess, because investors will look at these and say, hmm, risk adjusted, quite nice, potentially. And finally, for critiques of, of SIBs, uh, and we should take these seriously, I think, but we'll have different views on them, perhaps, and might discuss that in a moment. So they undermine the role of the state because they are privatizing welfare very often. You know, these are private models, private investment models delivering welfare services like education or um, rehabilitation for prisoners in, in, in prisons that you might argue, at least in some countries, should probably be provided by government. So that's a big critique for some people. Others say these are more efficient, they're better than government, government's broke, so they don't, can't do stuff. But we might hold that in our mind. There's another crit critique that says they make money on the back of the most vulnerable. You know, these, are, these are investment models which often create a return based on working with the most vulnerable, marginalized, poorest people in the world. And we might say, you know, if those people are getting good outcomes, why should we care? But some people see that as a critique. Some people see development impact bonds as just a new financial colonialism. What do I mean by that? I mean, you go into a poor country, you invest from uh, you know, a northern or western country, you make a profit, take it back to the northern or western country and their investors. Never sees the developing country accounting at all. The crit critique that says, um, oh, actually there's, there's five critiques under <laughs> there, not four. Anyway, allocate risk and return unfairly. I'll, I'll be quick on these because I should finish up. So, so there is a sense that you know, the balance between risk and return in SIBs is not always clear that it's to the benefit of the state or the beneficiaries or the service providers. It's not always clear that's true. I mean, that's the principle of them, but it's not always clear. Exit model is really important. What happens when you finish a SIB or a DIB? Do you do another one? How does that translate? If not, when it stops, the population loses their service. Are SIBs or DIBs the solution to the world's problems? Maybe we should leave that as a question for our Q&A. Okay, thank you. So let me invite uh, all the panelists uh, to the stage, and then we start uh, chatting. Okay, let's. Uh, very interesting. Um, Alex, uh, you raised uh, very interesting points, uh, particularly uh, you mentioned uh, this, uh, you know, critical of, you know, if this is so exciting, why is it so small? Uh, why is it so hard to scale? Um, you know, any thoughts? Maybe I'll start with Tae Hoon. Um, you know, throughout the, your process of doing the first SIP in uh, South Korea, uh, what sort of challenges you face? Uh, maybe that sheds some light to uh, um, uh, Alex's question of why is it so hard to do more? <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. And now I have now I have a chance to tell you the chronology. I I just skipped before, so the brief chronology of Seoul SIB. So. 
I had proposed that I published to, to Seoul city government in 2011. And at the time, Korea was suffering from social controversy about government spending. Con uh, progressive parties claimed that government should spend more for the public, while conservative parties claimed that government should spend efficiently. So I thought SIB can be a proper tool that improves the situation because it can make government spend efficiently, while government can spend more on, more on the public project with their saved money. But there was a problem. Government normally set their budget on an annual basis. So they decide how much money to spend next year in the end of this year. But with SIB, we can perform multi-year project and government spending differs according to the result. So government cannot decide exactly how much money to spend with SIB. So SIB had no legal base in Korea. So I visited the Seoul City Council and persuaded the councilman to establish an ordinance. So he suggested me to you know, write a draft of the ordinance. So I did not know that councilman does not write ordinances for by, by himself. So I wrote, the, wrote it for him. And fortunately, it was passed in 2014. But the first project I had suggested was rejected by the council. The reason was not that the project had any problem, but the most of the councilmen did not understand about SIB as well. However, I could not give, give it up, so I established Pan Impact Korea after that. And it was a big adventure, as we did not have any project for SIB in Korea. I had nothing to do except continuously persuading government officials and councilmen. Finally, in April 2015, exactly the same project we had suggested was passed by the city council. So Pan Impact Korea became the intermediary after that, and we raised capital and selected the service provider. This is a short story of how I overcame the It seems the like you point out a challenge of uh, the councilman doesn't understand uh, the structure as one of the key challenges. And maybe I throw that back, uh, question back to Alex. Uh, you, you, you talked about obviously UK has uh, the most number of SIBs, and uh, some people said that that's because UK government bought into this idea of saving public monies, and now you publicly destroy this, this argument and say, that, well, you don't actually save money. Would you con be concerned that you know, there will be less SIBs going forward if that momentum is being taken away? Uh, I don't know, I'm sure I destroyed it, but I, I said there was no evidence for it. It's not, I'm telling you what the evidence says. Um, there's no, no sign at all that's any, that that's created any kind of problem at all. I mean, we have to understand that the context of SIBs in the United Kingdom was as much political and ideological as it was, you know, economic or rational. I mean, there was a view that they could both augment the state by, by providing additional services or replace the state and therefore um, do a better job because they're somehow market driven. Uh, and it's worth noting in the United Kingdom, while the SIB market is, is but, a, but a 200 million or so of investment, the pay, pay for success or payment by results contracts the UK government issue is something like 22, 23 billion pounds. So actually the government has taken on board the idea of outcomes payments just in its contracts at a far higher level than SIBs or, or DIBs or any other kind of model. So I think the government's completely committed to this um, and it's, it's, it's moving its view from, from saving public money to improving the efficiency of public spending. And that's why the big money is going through government contracts, not through supporting SIBs. I see. Can I just yeah. say one other quick thing? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, I won't be very quick. And that's the, the question of scale here is an important one, but, but we have to ask ourselves, you know, what's the purpose of a social impact bond or a development impact bond? And it might well be that it's a laboratory. So it's a Petri dish. It's going to show something which government will then pick up in order to reform its own statutory services. I'm, I'm speaking, of course, of developed countries primarily. Right. And that's what happened in Britain with Peterborough. Can you, know. can you do talk a little bit more about that? Because well, yes, I think that's, uh, yeah, so you know, we're we, we sure. interested in that by doing sort of uh, the SIBs, the government actually will spend more time looking at outcome 
instead of just looking at outputs and inputs, which including the Hong Kong government sometimes just look yeah, at. Yeah. Um, but, you know, does that really help? Actually, that gives us hope. Well, I mean, it's one model when we think about scale. We could say, let's have more and more sibs and divs, let's get them bigger and bigger and bigger. That could be one model. But, I mean, the, the real money here is in government, right? I mean, sibs are going to have to get to be an enormous market before they get anywhere close to government spending in most, at least, developed countries anyway. So what happened with Peterborough, the first one, was the government saw it worked and they introduced a, a statutory service for all similar prisoners that the government paid for. I mean, as it happened, it put Peterborough out of the job because <laughs> it took their job away, if you like. But the government went, OK, we'll now make this a universal service. Now, there were some problems with that, but, the, but nevertheless, that was the transition. So suddenly it went from being 3,000 prisoners to being every prisoner in Britain as a statutory service. So, that's, so those, those are the two models of scale, I think. OK, that's interesting. And Xiaorong, uh, can you sort of talk about your you know, if people ask you, are you profiteering from these uh, vulnerable people, what is your answer? 15% I didn't I say are. that either, right? So, you know, don't tweet this for goodness <laughs> sake. We have a good relationship with UBS Optimus. Don't tweet it, right? Well, I, I, would, uh, I would prefer to um, outline another scenario to people here. So look at our dips here in India, that projects what's happening afterwards. Actually, the education girl, that group, that implementer, implementing organization was well accepted by India government and was invited to do uh, many uh, similar or a little bit customized programs in a lot of schools and provide their mechanism and, and approach to really help to improve the uh, girls or children's education over there. So I think that is one of the, um, what's happening after the DIPS uh, project. Another one is that, you know, uh, I think the DIP basically is because it's focusing on 100% measurable outcome. And uh, that's kind of a, such a, a rigorously uh, evidence-based uh, uh, projects. And it's going to be more easily to, take, to be taken by other investor, by other continual or uh, either private sector investor or not, or some other uh, development institution. They might easily to going on. And the, another question is that when you look at DIPS, people always criticize it's so expensive. You have to engage the, uh, the, the professional advisory uh, organization to help design the whole process. Uh, actually, you have to work with even law firm to uh, come out all those contracts among those stakeholders. You have to have uh, evaluators, right, to working all the process, all those things. And then people, the second question is that, are we have to do all the way along the projects later afterwards. And from my personal perspective is that, uh, you know, once you prove this model is okay, and the, once you trust that this implementer works well, and the model works well, probably you don't need to spend that much, that much effort or money on that aspect. So for that dips, uh, I think it's the, mo the most uh, significant um, uh, the, the role for DIPS model or SIPS model is really to attracting those uh, uh, potential investors who really looking at the outcomes and the measurable outcomes and who really would, like, would not really like to take the risk and the first step. So uh, in addition to government funding, we are also looking at other private sector's funding source. And, uh, and for Option Foundation, we already start thinking about the deep fund. For, for that deep fund, we're not only by ourselves as a risk investor, we also uh, have some implementer organization or some other playholders would like to be part of the investor in the beginning. And, uh, and then they will also need, they could be reward when the projects be successful. So, and I think that's kind of a development of the DIPS from the DIPS to development to DIPS fund also uh, give our Chari traditional charitable donors a chance to think about, okay, I would like to join the develop, uh, deep fund. Is it a minimum return threshold? Um, you know, for example, would you be uh, interested in, like, you know, the Peterborough case was uh, 3% uh, per annum. Um, so that's obviously, uh, you know, f far lower than the 15% they've got. I'm just interested in, like, how do you sort of, uh, is it a, 
is there a minimum threshold that you looked at for, for sort of returns like this? Well, um, basically the average you were looking at is about like 8% or 5 to 8%. But, uh, you know, because the dips is, it's, it's this model, it's when you are doing investment, you take the risk. You can't be fail. You can't be no any reward. Yeah, of course. So, so I mean, when you look at the uh, education girls dips, actually uh, look at the payment structure, it's very complicated. You know, uh, you allocate the ratio or return ratio depends on all those um, data, you know, uh, based on kind of a formulate, for, uh, formulating uh, counting things. So that's, yeah. Okay. Can you um, also, uh, I, I think the two of you mentioned uh, the, the template, you know, for example, in UK, you have this uh, uh, contract template that, that Alex, you mentioned, and um, um, you know, uh, Tae Hoon, you mentioned that there are four, five municipal ordinances that is passed related to SIBs. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, what sort of government role that you think should play or could play to facilitate uh, the development of the SIB market? I mean, maybe Alvin, you want to talk about that? So there's, uh, I think that for Hong Kong, there's uh, quite a number of uh, uh, roles that the government can pay. Um, so the first one is, of course, just like, um, say, um, some type of standardization of contract because we are just uh, beginning of a pilot of a PFS project. And, uh, and other uh, and other things that the government can do is to uh, think about how to improve their evaluation system. And just like the report that, uh, that, that pay for success report that we launched last year, so we have uh, tried to count uh, the number of uh, key performance indicators in in the suspension system, and uh, I could say 84 percent. If I remember correctly, is about output output base. So just uh, talking about people served, uh, the service hour provided, um, and just about six, 15 and 60 percent is so-called outcome base. But uh, so the, the the outcome based KPI is about so satisfaction. So uh, is sometimes is a little bit. Meaningless uh, to 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 the uh, to the society because we want to know the change of the people, you know, to uh, understand the uh, 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 to understand the outcome of the any service uh, provided. So I think to develop the SIB, so uh, the government should take the role, the leading the leading role to uh, say create a system for uh, outcome based evaluation. Say sharing the data, so try to uh, create a data collection uh, system. I think that would be very good. Do you agree, Alex? On how important is the standardization of document and uh uh, evaluation method to, uh, for, for the development of this SIB market? Uh, well, as I mentioned, the, uh, the government, UK government uh, social impact bond center webpage has some pro forma kind of contracts, you know, that they're learning from. And they're, and is is I mean, that important though? Or some, some other country, for example, well, US doesn't have that? I mean, well, I mean, in the US, it's very interesting, unlike Britain, the SIB contracts, because they're considered public sector uh, contracting, are actually all publicly available. Um, we, you know, there are some of the confidential information isn't there, but bizarrely in the UK, you can't see real SIP contracts, but you can in the US because different regulation there. Uh, I mean, I think standardize, I mean, you know, standardization of all this stuff will, will reduce transaction costs, which is, as, as we heard earlier, you know, a major problem in setting these things up. So I think that's all good. Um, just to your point about uh, government action, though, I can just give one example from Britain where I think it was about five years ago, the UK government introduced something called social investment tax relief, which is a 25% tax relief on investments in, in social organizations that you can use against other tax uh, liabilities. And one of the categories that are eligible for social investment tax relief are SIBs. So if you invest in SIBs, you can get a tax relief. Now that's a very concrete way of changing the dynamics we were hearing earlier about risk and return, you know, what's your actual return, your return offset by tax relief. So that's a really concrete thing governments can do if they wish to, to crowd in investors, particularly with this difficulty about, you know, what's, we have no idea what's a real return. 8% sounds reasonable to me or 5 to 8%, but I mean, this market is too young and too immature for us to have any idea what a proper risk adjusted return is, I think. Texas a uh, huge lever. Uh, Kei Hoon, can you talk about you know the uh, the SIB ordinance uh, in in Korea? How important is that? Oh, important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I already already told her about that. <laughs> but okay. yeah, uh, 
What, do, and, what and, does the ordinance do? Because in UK or in other places, they don't need to have an ordinance ah, yeah. in order for people to do SIB. For example, in Hong Kong, we are doing SIB hopefully soon, and, and we are not passing any ordinances to, to do that. So why is it important for your ah, career yeah. to actually have maybe an ordinance? Maybe I, I, I'm telling it twice, maybe. But so, <laughs> yeah, any, government budget is set annual, on an annual basis. So when I, no, when I told, told about SIB first, at the, uh, to the government officials, they rejected rejected to accept it because there's no legal base. Because they only spend, they only you know, decide how the budget for the next year only. So we so we cannot you know we cannot exactly decide how much money to spend in multi-year project for for multi-year projects. So so that's why I visited the Seoul City Council and yeah. That, Understood. All right. Uh, I will leave the uh, floor open for questions from the floor. Any questions uh, that you would like to ask? Yes, in the back and in front, in the back first. Hello. Huh? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm getting a bit embarrassed if I have to stand up. <laughs> Tilo Lee of Dongfa College. Uh, I mean, education. So I'm really interested in uh, Alex sharing about education educate for girls and uh, I was amazed by the profit that the project has made the total return was over 55 percent and that's a bit amazing can education be so profitable uh, <laughs> I wonder if it is possible for me to get the business model of of this educate educate for girls and the investment was 270,000 US that's a good deal. Right? So another thing is, uh, how could they make it so profitable? So does that mean they charge a relatively high tuition? or How could they make it so profitable? Do you want to answer? Yeah. Huh? Thank sure. you. UBS is the, uh, is the okay. investor, so uh, nice. yeah. they got a good deal, they said. But they actually reimbursed you know, the money out, so... Uh. Yeah, well, actually, um, we invested um, um, 20... Uh, uh, actually, the invested money were re recruited by the outcome payer, uh, which is the Children um, Investment Fund Foundation. That is uh, pre-discussing. That's when we uh, developed the depths for these projects. Everything has been defined, you know, be based on the, uh, on the outcome um, metrics, uh, based on the performance uh, uh, data uh, uh, meet. So that is not because they charge the fee of the school students, not at all. So this is basically uh, the relationship between the investor and the uh, outcome payer. So that's kind of an agreement deal. So uh, anyhow, you know, for this kind of deal, you always have the cap for eventually how much you are going to be received, even though you are mostly successful. So with this case, I would say we were almost reached to the cap that both parties agreed with. So, and uh, in terms of why this project is so successfully, so the, even though the investment is small, you know, actually education um, grow that organization. I think this kind of project also benefits implementing organization a lot because it's also changed their mindset, their behavior from output uh, driven into outcome focusing. And uh, during the whole process, because that whole model provides the evaluator, you provide the um, process performance management organization. So during the whole process, they can really work together to quickly uh, respond to um, when the outcome were not, were not met, to try to identify uh, why, what's the problem. And then they can quickly adapt and uh, to correct the course or change the implementing way. So I think like uh, this uh, model, uh, compared with traditional uh, financial pay model, it's almost the same. You know, when you're wanting to do a good impact projects, you always want to empower the implementing organization together and help them together. So, so. the question is why the investors have such a high return. And I think it's the, way, the way I see it, if I can translate what you just said, is that it's basically a bilateral uh, deal between the payer 
and the investor, right? So the payer CIIF in this case, while but just saying they are, in a way they, they, they negotiated uh, what they thought is good deal for themselves because they wanted to see outcome. And, but they're also generous in the sense that, you know, if the outcome achieved, they are willing to pay you that much. So it's really a bilateral deal between CIF and UBS. And so the fact that UBS got pretty high, uh, a lot of money is because, you know, CIF is really generous. So my question originally was that, well, you know, is there a, um, so therefore the return ultimately is really a negotiated return. It's really not, there's not a market return per se. Yeah, story. but you, if you look at the number, actually, we are achieved, it's much, much higher than everybody expected, I will say, to be honest. So the because outcome is good, therefore you got outcome, paid. outcome is almost a rich, like, look at number, it's one, it's 116% um, over. So basically, the average maybe is only 70%, or, you know, in terms of enrollment sense. So basically, if you look at all the Option Foundation charitable programs, look at our things that... Uh, Average like a 17% KPI are should be delivered. Can so I that is the average uh, achievement. So and I think for the uh, CIF, I have everybody understands that. But this project is extremely mm. successful. Uh, can I, Alex? Do you, what, what is sort of the medium or average return that you have seen across all these SIB 100 SIB? Sort of the uh, the maximum return that you have seen. Well, probably this one. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying like. <laughs> Average returns uh, achieved, let's say. Yeah, for I've, we haven't done that analysis, and I've never seen anybody do it, so I wouldn't want to uh, to give you a fake number. I mean, my uh, my sense, and this is my sense, not based on the data, would be something in the order of what you're saying. Five to eight percent seems a reason. I mean, in, in impact investing generally, that five to eight percent kind of number range seems to be acceptable to quite a lot of investors. So I would suspect that's a sweet spot, and anything above that is going to be very welcome. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Uh, uh, the gentleman here in the front. Yes. The mic is coming, and we have a question here, here, and there. So we have four questions. Yes. Yes. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much to all speakers for very interesting presentations. And uh, a lot of this is relatively new to me, so apologies if my question may be naive. Um, I, probably a question for Alex. I was struck by the um, social outcome and the fixing in the case of Peterborough of the 7.5% figure and the art, science, mechanics process of coming up with that figure in the sense that if the number is too high, it suggests there's a very easy outcome. So why should one go through this process? On the other hand, if it's too low, then the potential for a, an enormous return um, is there. So I wondered if you had any insights on, on how that worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can tell you. So. It, it was this, <laughs> finger in the air, you know, the, the, the two parameters really that, I mean, Social Finance UK really brokered that, uh, that deal. The two parameters they were working under were how much would the outcome payer actually pay, which was the UK Ministry of Justice. So they negotiated with them an, a, a maximum number and kind of reverse engineered what the different outcomes to return would have to look like, I think. And then there was a kind of sense of, you know, which the conversation has, has, has gone this way a little bit this afternoon. Um, and it's maybe my fault, but I apologize. You know, is there a kind of profiteering point here where you want to cap returns because it's kind of seems inappropriate. So they, they came up with a range between what they negotiated with the outcomes payer and what they thought was sufficient to get investors in but it was total guesswork. There was really no science to it or analysis. It was kind of, well, let's see. And okay. that, of course, will change. I mean, as we get more and more of these SIBs, some kind of market analysis will begin to emerge and we can look at it as we get data. But that first one was, was a kind of good guess. But one interesting point about, just sorry, briefly on this question of, uh, of, of excess returns, I mean, it really depends on where you sit in the deal and how you look at that, because if, we all believe in social impact bonds and development impact bonds as being really important in the toolkit of welfare and we want more and more money to go into them from the private sector don't we want them to be providing amazing returns that's the way you'll crowd in finance now look at it from a different perspective and that's profiteering or that's something inappropriate but it really depends where you sit in the deal about how you feel about these numbers and whether you want a cap or not or how that looks like so it's a 
that's a, uh, to me, I mean, uh, I defer to my colleagues, but to me that feels like a really interesting live debate. Yeah. Okay, question here or there first, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm actually working with an uh, international NGO called Plan International, uh, helping children in the world. Uh, so I'm very in interested in, um, say, the fun thing in Hong Kong, just mentioned by um, uh, Ms. Seal, you mentioned about that you will be uh, investing in Hong Kong. See, I can see a trend from your PowerPoint. So what is the potential of the uh, SIB in Hong Kong? And is there many operators working on this? And how can INGO work with you? Maybe I can take a couple more questions, guys, because we only have five minutes left. So I'll take one more, couple more questions in the back yeah, first. Yes. And then we answer together. Yeah, two more in the back and one here. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. So my question might be directed to Mr. Kwan on the blockchain SIP. So by understanding the maturity um, and the limitation of blockchain technology so far, I was quite curious on um, how are you integrating blockchain and SIP and by what ways, in which kind of areas and uh, in what ways is blockchain uh, helping SIB to be more kind of efficient or solving what kind of prob problems and you also your learning so far on it? Thank you. Okay. You know. Yes. Yes. Um, I guess my question is for all the panelists here. I feel like um, the conversations that we had so far for return is focusing on the financial return aspect of it. What about social return? Is there any consensus amongst practitioner and academia about what's the latest in conversations or dialogues? Um, are we actually talking about that anymore or are we going to just focus on the financial and everyone have their own method to assess the social return? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. The, the one in the front. Thanks for the inspiring like dialogue. My question is around the governance, like a bit like the evaluation um, mechanism. Is there any room, like potential, to develop kind of like third party, like um, like credit rating agency, kind of like in the finance world we talk about numbers, like mm. in the development world we're talking about individual phase. So is there any like like uh, impact assessment can potentially develop a third party agency to to assess this kind of like SIPs, like um, social in, uh, impact bonds, this kind of like investment tools. Okay, uh, so why don't we do a last round up by each panelist. Uh, we have a couple questions out there. Uh, maybe I start out with Elvin, you want to go first? Uh, so uh, maybe I just uh, give some response about so uh, the, the, the question from the back. Uh, the lady one so about and also of the government uh, question so uh, to to talk about so uh, whether the SRB ignore the non-financial outcome or not so I think it is uh, they the SRB try to uh, monetize those uh, non-financial outcome in fact so the interest payment uh, the principal repayment all, all depends on some uh, non-financial outcome so they are really related so therefore SRB does pay attention to that but one of the challenges that I've mentioned in my presentation is some, fa some outcome, some some outcome, for example, your psychological well-being, it is quite difficult to measure. So uh, sometimes, so in this case, so this outcome is a little bit difficult to be, uh, to be, to be framed as an SIB. So uh, it's quite depending on the project. But uh, most of the, if the, if the project itself can, can have some more uh, quantifiable uh, social outcome, then I think it will be uh, served uh, uh, by SIB. And for the uh, agencies or credit agent problem, um, I, I think um, this is what we always, uh, our Hong Kong Foundation always advocate, but it's not really the agents. We advocate for, for a so-called, what we call, uh, want to have a data bank, social fair data bank. Um, just what I have mentioned, because uh, when you do any type of uh, evaluation, so even uh, the waiting, waiting uh, mechanism, um, we need a lot of data. And uh, in Hong Kong, we, I can say that there's almost uh, no data uh, for outcome. And, 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 and the sad thing is, uh, in, in other countries, so the university academia, they try, they can do a lot of research on their own society. But in Hong Kong, most of the academia just try to do the research in other 
countries, but not within Hong Kong. So if they can be encouraged faith by UGC, RGC to uh, investigate, to do more academic research in for local society, then uh, those data can be grouped together to can share them in public such that the, they can be making as a data bank and they can be provided to the third party agents to say wait the social projects. I mean, that will be, um, that will be fantastic, I think. Thank you. Okay, Xiao, um, can you work with her on her project? Yes. <laughs> okay, I will basically uh, try to address the social return things and also what we are uh, exploring in Hong Kong. So first, actually, uh, DIPS or SIPS uh, basically is a result-based financing mechanism. It's a supplementary way to traditional charitable giving. So we're talking about result-based so basically, that's a precondition. So it's more emphasis. It's, it's focused more on the social return, on the project return, uh, I'm sorry, outcome return. So we're really looking at what the project has addressed, what the outcome has been achieved. That is definitely on the implementing uh, level. It's not on the social level at all. So it's really look at their solution, uh, the solutions, efficiency, effectiveness, thing, and it's also be quantitized, so it's measurable. So that's the most uh, important thing for all those steps. If without all those data things, there's no any financial return could be talked about. So that's, uh, I want to emphasize that um, even though today people are talking about the return yeah, My rate, fault, sorry. I, I I love talking about money, so yeah. actually about uh, social is, is, is the foundation yeah, of what we talked about. It's more so. about uh, basically trying to uh, even shift the mindset from output to outcome. And, uh, and also for investor, you put more money on the evaluation part and also outpayer together. So that first thing. Second thing, regarding our Hong Kong um, um, planning, I would say planning is probably too uh, premature to talk about, but uh, after our uh, a practice and experience where well, the first thing is that they've always trying to uh, localize. You know, when we were in Hong Kong, we were trying to first to understand the um, landscaping here and who might be the different stakeholders, like the evaluators and the outpayers. And you know, UBS is, uh, we also would like to leverage our finance expertise and also our uh, clients' uh, resources, not only looking at the fund public funding source. So, and also, um, always important we need to do our, our, our uh, baseline or survey to understand what's happening here, particularly on our uh, target group people like children and uh, the service to children, education, health, or protection, or, or, or whatever empower um, projects that uh, children could be benefit. So I guess I can introduce Great. here. Thank you. Uh, to whom particular the uh, blockchain is this just a buzzword or is it really useful? Yeah, I'll tell you about blockchain combined SIB. Um, <coughs> though, uh, though SIB is the one of the most innovative impact investing tools, it has its own limitations. Firstly, while it has the name social impact bond, it is in fact not a bond, it is investment contract. That means Traders, uh, investors cannot trade SIBs in the market and investors are hard to liquidate their money until the end of the project. So it, incre it actually increases the risk of investment. On, and secondly, the payout structure of SIB is normally very complicated. So, so the pay, payout, uh, calculating to, calculation of payout for investors is somewhat complicated too. So it will increase the transaction cost of SIB. So to overcome these limitations, I made a breakthrough with a new technology called blockchain and smart contract. Blockchain is the technology that, you know, that stores data in distributed networks. It has no need of any centralized server and as, as every participant in the network shares the same data. It is tamper-proof and immutable unless someone controls the majority of the network, which is practically very hard. Smart contract is a program that is installed in blockchain network. So with a smart contract, we can run, a, or run particular, particular functions in blockchain network. So I made 
SIB smart contract and named it Smart SIB. With Smart SIB, we, we, uh, we digitized and securitized original investment contract. So the, the right of shares of investment was segmented into transferable units like stock, stocks and initially sent to original investors. The investors can check their balances and, and transfer them to other investors safely. After the project ends, income per share will be precisely and quickly calculated and, and the investors can check their final incomes conveniently. I think Smart SIB is a good case that demonstrates the potential of innovative, innovative technology, to, technology applied to social innovation. Okay, thank you. Alex, any last uh, parting yeah, two, two quick things. I know it's almost time to go, or it is time to go. In terms of impact measurement, um, this is an area where we get, I think, unnecessarily confused. So the first thing to say is that um, we've had 50 years of public accounting putting prices on human welfare activities. And so we already know all that. We know what the, you know what the value to the state is of a child getting an education or not getting an education and so forth. Um, what SIBs are doing are finding out what that value is to an investor. And that we don't know yet. So I think as, as SIB contracts proliferate and DIB contracts proliferate, we'll find out not the value put on various interventions by the state, we know all that already, but whether the investor thinks it's the same value or not. And we don't know the answer to that question yet, but the, this, this business of kind of monetizing impact is well understood, that's nothing new. Um, and we do a fantastic course at Oxford in July on impact measurement and management, all come along. That's the only advert. Um, briefly, just on the ratings point, um, I mean, many, of, many SIBs have independent and have to have independent um, measurement experts as part of the contract. So nobody's going to allow the service provider to tell you how brilliantly they've done without somebody checking. So that's, that's a common model, but that's not quite the same as a ratings agency. I think that may come over time when the market's big enough. But at the moment, I think it's fair to say, generally speaking, the data is quite robust because it has to be to satisfy all the members of the contract and uh, trigger payments and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's give uh, the panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, I think we need to give you some souvenir. Yes. Yes, thank you. And then we take a picture together? Yes, okay. We love our picture. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a picture together. Let's take a photo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you